Welcome to the Momentum Lifestyle Podcast, where we interview an inspiring, educational, and entertaining guest to help you build confidence, find balance, and live a life of impact. We'd like to thank our sponsor today, Be Spunky. Now, Blake, Janoa, and myself have been using their Reboot product for well over six months now, and it has been life-changing. I found myself recovering faster, having way more energy throughout the day, and honestly feeling just more jacked up as a man. And this is because Reboot is clinically formulated to support healthy male hormone levels, providing stress relief, improved strength and stamina, enhanced drive, and overall well-being. B-Spunky Reboot contains a proprietary blend of 10 natural and organic herbs and active ingredients that are renowned for helping men to enhance physical and cognitive performance, improve stamina, energy, and endurance, optimize testosterone levels, support healthy reproductive function, support cardiovascular function, relieve stress, mild anxiety, irritability, relieve tiredness, fatigue, support healthy sleep patterns, and support healthy body weight. So as you can see, it is a must-have product for all men. So head to their website, bespunky.com.au, that's B-E-S-P-U-N-K-I.com.au, and use the code MOMENTUM to receive 10% off all Be Spunky products. Shani Timms, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Blake Worrell Thompson. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Guys, we're doing something different today, very different. We're actually going to record two episodes mm. um, split over two weeks for both of our podcasts, for, so for Shani's and um, mine as well. Um, all kind of around relationships, our, I guess, path, our history, um, and hopefully you guys can take a few things away from it. Um, I think we should also preface for anyone who doesn't know either of us, uh, we are dating and we've been dating for oh, the cool. past um, probably over a year now. Um, mm. So yeah, just to set that scene, just so you don't think it's too random, it's just having a chat about weird things. Perfect, cool. Babe. Perfect, cool. All right, yes. do you want to get... So what we did is um, we put out to social media that we were going to do a podcast together and asked people to ask questions. So... We've got about, uh, I think about 10 questions that we'll ask each other over the course of the two podcast episodes. Um, and yeah, we'll just kind of expand on those. And if there's anything that either of us say that we think we, we could expand on or, or hopefully add some value, then we'll um, expand on that as well. So, babe, do you want to ask the first question that we got? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, how did you guys meet? <laughs> Great question. So, um, what? Actually, you should you share the story better than I, and then I'll come All in right. my bit. <laughs> okay. Well, I, like I've always had this thing where, like, I just love hearing about how people meet, and it's mm. just been for me. I always just wanted that amazing story of like, you know, you're walking down the street and you just bump into this person. Like, I really like romanticize this idea of meeting my person in my head. So, um, I actually like love our story so much because. Um, yeah, it's super special. So I had just started at a local cafe, the General Store. Shout out to those guys. They're amazing in Byron. And it was my first day and my first shift. I think it was like the 2nd of Jan last year. And anyway, I was just having the best day ever and, you know, walking around and meeting new people. And I remember like going outside and serving these two guys who were sitting there. Uh, lo and behold, it was Blake and Genoa. And they were sitting there in the exercise gear. And I literally remember you're sitting on like the long table out the front of the Jenny. And you were both like so smiley and so um, friendly and you were asking questions. And yeah, I just remember thinking like, oh my God, I'm like, cool. These guys are epic. Like, and I just remember, yeah, your beaming smiles and just that you were so interested and just like really genuine. And I kind of like walked away and I was like, hmm, I'm like, those guys are really nice. And then um, should we flick to your side of the story? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> obviously Janelle and I were there just hanging out um, and met Shani. And then um, I think it was, yeah, it was pretty quickly. We literally, I can't remember how long we spoke for, but you walked inside and I just said to Janelle, there's something special about that chick. Um, and sure. <laughs> that, that, that Sheila, there's something about it. There's something about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think for Bo, were you dating anyone at that time? No. I was like, see, I think oh, I just yeah. started seeing someone. Yeah. yeah. And I was yeah. very loosely kind of seeing someone as well. So 
nothing really um, came of that all that quickly. I think it was literally, yeah, it was pretty much six months that we kind of built a pretty solid friendship from at the start, like really close. Um, and then that kind of transitioned as well. And I suppose it wasn't even just the friendship. It was like um, I was helping you with your business in terms mm. of like website and design. And so we we had this opportunity to work really closely together, um, build a friendship together. And then it was just got to this point where we would both say this thing like, oh, we've got like an unspeakable thing, not unspeakable, yeah, unspeakable thing mm. um, or n- uh, knowing between the two of us. And it, I remember it got to one point where I was like, all right, what the heck? I'm like, what is this unspeakable, you know, knowing that we have, like spell it out, like what are you feeling? And then anyway, we both just realised we were madly in love with each other and we just <laughs> needed to give this a go. Um, yeah. But yes, not all smooth sailing, might we add, <laughs> but it was definitely fun. What do you mean by the smooth sailing bit? Well, at the start, um, and mm. I'm sure we'll get into this in a little bit or we can touch on it now, but um yeah, it was funny because I was so not used to a secure relationship. Mm. And I remember you saying to me, like, a secure relationship might feel a little bit, not so much boring, but a little bit, like, normal that you're kind of, like, trying to pick it apart and be like, what's wrong? Mm. And um, and I remember just feeling so comfortable around you and feeling, like, so at ease and just, like, yeah, like, there must, there has to be something wrong with this guy mm. because I was so used to dating guys who really triggered my attachment style. So I, you and me actually both like we're anxious avoidant, um, which is like that tiny little percentile that's just got the best of both anxious and avoidant attachment styles. Um, If you guys don't know what we're talking about, read the book Attached. Um, But I remember feeling like quite unsettled when we first started our relationship because I was like, oh, yeah, one, there must be something wrong or two, I'm just waiting for him to, you know, turn into a, a fuck boy um, or it, I just, I didn't, I hadn't felt in a long time feeling really safe and it felt really odd for me. What about your attachment style? Were you, you were quite. Um, yeah, well, I was anxious avoiding as well. And I think um, the, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time over the last kind of two years between relationships really making sense of, my patterning in previous relationships um, and felt a lot more settled <clears throat> coming into ours. But also, yeah, it was just that 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 kind of first month energetically was a bit unsettling. Mm. Um, and that really unsettled me a bit, you know, in that, in that first month. And then we kind of were able to, you know, talk through it and move through it. But also and I know this is a question that we've got that we'll go into a bit more different uh, in, in a bit more detail in a sec, is most of my previous relationships, you know, albeit amazing girls, were really unsettling, like up, down, up, down, just a fucking absolute circus. So, and, you know, a lot of that weight is on my shoulders in terms of my own dysfunction, which I had to spend a lot of time making sense of and, and owning properly. And, you know, aside from probably that first three weeks where we were just kind of finding our feet, the first three months were so smooth that it actually made me anxious and Mm -hmm. similar to, you know, a common theme with anxious avoidance or even trauma bonding, you know, and, and many of these terms that are getting thrown around is if you're used to dysfunction, then function can really challenge your nervous system. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd often laugh and, and say things to Janelle, like, I wonder what the fuck she's hiding. There's got to be something, you know, because <laughs> we weren't living together at that stage. Yeah. And I was just waiting for something to to come to light. And eventually, I think probably after about three months, you know, I was able to kind of really settle into my groove. And, and you know, based on what you're saying and, and how you felt, I think you kind of probably, you probably settled a bit quicker than me. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was a, a slightly challenging first few weeks and then we're in our groove after that and I remember we both kept on saying to each other like it gets to be this easy and we were kind of like both shocked and surprised when we were saying it like it it can be easy in a relationship doesn't need to be this you know push pull like you know triggering each other um which I think we were both sort of used to in the past so Mm. um yeah I hope that can kind of be expansive for anyone listening being like oh it does get to be easy and I think a massive part of of that which made it that way is we were very good at communicating with each other Mm. and like right from the beginning we were like 
you know, if either one of us was triggered or activated, it would be like, oh, I, I'm really feeling this right now. So it was like voicing it, but then also stating like, this is what I need right now. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was like early on in the piece and you had gone away on a few trips and I was like, you know, when you go away, like I, you know, I don't want to sound needy, but like this would really make me feel comfortable is maybe we just have a FaceTime, you know, once a day or a quick phone call or just a check-in. Um, but I think sometimes people can be like, afraid to speak their needs in a relationship because it might sound needy but yeah what what were your sort of thoughts on like sharing your needs early on well the other thing um to kind of expand on that and I don't know whether you want to say it or whether you want to kind of leave this bit out it's up to you is (laughs) now now that we've gone there yeah is um communicating your needs and we'll go into that in a sec is, is obviously super important and when someone can communicate and you can understand on a deeper level why that bit's important, Mm. then it's easier to um, really kind of solidify that. And, you know, do you want to talk about your history with travel? My history? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I was like, what are we going into here? Um, Yeah, so I would have a thing that any partner who I was with, like whenever they went away, they would have either cheated on me or they would have like been with somebody else. Or um, when someone went away um, or, or they would change their mind about the relationship. So for me, you know, my new partner uh them going away was actually very um activating and very triggering for me Mm. and it wasn't because I didn't trust you but it was like that situation was charged with like Mm. you know 10 years worth of data my data in my head that oh someone goes away that equals abandonment that equals um, I'm gonna get really hurt that equals Mm. they're not gonna be with me anymore Mm. so like even just voicing that with you was was quite good because it wasn't you were like, I'm not going to take this personally because I know that this isn't about me and it's about me just creating a safer space or doing what I need to do to, to kind of let you move through what you need mm. to. That so. then puts a really different um, spin on, on things for me because, you know, option one is that you get a little bit anxious when I go away and, it, you know, you, you kind of um, get drawn into that anxious attachment style, um, you know, which could cause a little bit of unsettling in the relationship but as soon as I understand where that stems from then I'm extra mindful of checking in extra mindful of FaceTime extra mindful of doing you know things that might help soothe that piece for you as opposed to you being anxious for the whole period of time so it's really good to one obviously connect with your needs but two also if you can understand you know where they're coming from um, then it's really helpful for both parties. And I think from, from the start, we were pretty good at communicating our needs and, and also keep in mind that we had six months of friendship prior to that, which made communicating our needs um, really easy. And obviously, because I knew, you know, in our, in our friendship that you were looking to heal that kind of people pleasing cool chick part of yourself. Mm. I really um, emphasize the importance of you communicating your needs. And I think, you know, probably in our rituals of connection, which we'll talk about soon, Mm. I would constantly ask you, what are your needs? Where are your needs being met? Where are they not? What, what did you want to say that you didn't and really give you the space to build confidence in communicating your needs and knowing that, you know, I, I was here to support them and meet them where I could. Um, and that you felt that you, you know, you felt that you had the confidence to kind of voice those as well. So. Yeah. And that felt quite refreshing for me because I don't think I'd ever had that space in past relationships mm. where it was a safe space that I could voice what I needed. And I wasn't being told like, don't be ridiculous. You know, um, you're too clingy, you're too needy. Um and back to that point of, as well, when we have a deeper understanding of the why behind it, we actually can realise it's not about us, like, and it's about, you know, like their history and their story, um, which kind of feels a lot better, you know. And it was also, I think, one of the the challenges in the early stages is it's really easy to have the rose-coloured glasses on and to not voice your needs or not voice your opinion. And even start to shift away from what you really value so you know for me I'm up at five o'clock 
every morning. And even in that honeymoon period, I was up at five o'clock every morning. It, nothing really changed for us. I don't think, you know, it's, it's easy to lose sight of, of your, your values and your priorities. And I think that was one of the things that we did really well was you kept doing, you know, everything that you did. I kept doing everything that I did. We didn't really shift too much. And to be fair, you know, one of the, the luxuries that we've got in our relationship is that we're so aligned that there isn't a huge amount that we've had to compromise on because we kind of live a very similar lifestyle and have similar interests yeah. as well. So, you know, and I still got up at 5am mm. most mornings and you still got up and did your nature walks and went to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't a huge amount that we had to change. And I think it's quite interesting to bring that up because most people, when they get into a relationship, they're like all in, like, give it my all. We're going to, you know, completely throw everything that we love, um, you know, individually out the window because I'm going all in on this relationship. And like, I've completely done this in the past and you're creating a, like a standard for a relationship that isn't um, sustainable. Like you're going to hit a point and it's going to be at the end of the honeymoon period and you're going to be like, oh, I've lost everything that I actually love doing. Um, and and it's going to, the relationship is going to shift and it's going to look a lot different. And that's what even was quite good for my nervous system is our relationship has been consistent the whole mm. time. It wasn't like I had a very different Blake in honeymoon that I am receiving now. It's actually gotten better. But I think it was because we did invest a lot of time in the beginning in like let's let's actually take this a bit slower and like let's space this out and let's stick to our individual lives being amazing and then we come together and then it's equally amazing mm. whereas instead of going all in and losing ourselves and becoming this like codependent mishmash of, of a relationship um which you know i think we've both so been there before um but just yeah like completely holding us strong in in our individual lives and just knowing that we're accompanying each other not a mashed Beautifully said, babe. Thanks, babe. <laughs> so um, you spoke about attachment style before. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, how that has showed up for you potentially in previous relationships and mm. how that might have even transitioned in our relationship as well? So I want to bring up a funny story here, and, and I think it's called protesting behaviour in the book Attached. Mm. But um, I would, like, try and you know, cause I was so, I was so like on edge. I'm like, oh my God, they haven't messaged me. They haven't texted me. Like, let me go out of my way to show them that I'm here and show them my presence. So for example, like it might be, you know, a guy in town and, and, and I would be like driving past a certain thing, knowing they'll be there or like changing what I'm genuinely doing, which, you know, is manipulative, but changing what you're doing to um, get in front of them and, and like, kind of be like, oh, you know, be front of mind. Um, but that was because I, like my, um, I felt very uneasy because either they hadn't messaged or they hadn't called or they hadn't, um, you know, made contact and made me feel uh, like confident they were going to reach out. Mm. Whereas like kind of in our, in our relationship, it was like, oh, like you, you're very good at saying what you, whatever you say you're going to do, you're going to follow through with. So, you know, if you said you're going to call, you're going to call. If you said you're going to message, you're going to message. And immediately I didn't feel that need to manipulate what I was doing to get in front of you. It was very much, um, I just had a lot of trust in that you were going to say what you did and that helped me sort of settle in and not feel like I needed to, you know, be that kid being like, oh, my God, like, look at me, look at me. And, like, it's funny when you say these um, things out loud, like even me voicing that, I'm like, oh my God, that sounds so ridiculous. But like, you've got to think as well, when you're in this state of triggered attachment style, it's not a 29 year old woman. You're literally, it's a, it's a, it's your inner child screaming for attention and love and safety. So, you know, it might seem ridiculous on the outside, but it's like really deep down. It's like, that's your inner child just seeking validation and seeking love. Um, I'm trying to think how else it would, uh, it, like the, the difference in the head noise between you know, previous people I've dated and our relationship is massive. So it was all consuming when I was dating, especially when I was dating avoidance and I didn't really know what that was at the time. I, my brain, it would just be constantly like, when are they going to message? When are they going to ask to see me? You're unpacking everything that they've said, looking for validation, looking for clarity, looking for, um, oh yeah, they did say they were going to, you know, message or they said we we're going to have another date. Um, like it was like my head was just completely clouded with this overthinking, this anxiety, this just constant 
narrative of like seeking validation, seeking validation. Whereas in the secure one, like what we have, um, when we started, it was, yes, there was a little bit that, but there was nowhere near as much as head noise. And it actually like, I was like, oh my God, I'm like, how nice to actually have room to think about work and think about life and think about friends rather than it being all consuming. And I do think that's a really good signpost for anyone who's maybe just started dating. If it is all consuming, maybe start to think about like what part of me is really triggered and activated right now. And how can I actually start giving something to myself that is going to make me feel safe, that's going to make me feel loved, and that's going to make me feel seen? Because as long as we're externally seeking it, we're never going to be able to heal it ourselves. And two of the, you, one of them you mentioned there, um, which is super important from a bloke's point of view, um, is integrity and really being aligned between your words and your actions if you're going to create safety in a relationship. And the other one, I'm not sure if you can remember this, it's so long ago now, yeah. is I knew that if you sent a message or you said something where there's a level of vulnerability that I would, even if I was like doing something and I was busy, if I had a moment to like stop and acknowledge it mm. and then tell you I'd come back to it a few hours later, just so you weren't sitting in that kind of anxious energy as well. Yeah. So I think we, I probably did that, yeah, yeah, half a dozen times or whatever. I knew there was a vulnerability and you'd put yourself out a bit. Yeah. And I didn't want you to, you know, sit in that kind of anxious state for three, four, five hours if I was kind of in the middle of something. And I think so, that goes for everything as well. Yeah. Like it's like any friendship or relationship. It's like if you can, you know, if they have put themselves online and said a vulnerable message, but you don't have space for it, be like, yep, received. I'll get back to you in mm. whatever time feels good. Just to put that other person at ease. Mm. Mm. Talking of communication. Yeah. How <laughs> have we gone communicating boundaries? I think like, obviously we're not perfect at any of this, but I think um, quite well. And I think it really comes down to having that, you know, time and, and getting that practice in on our rituals of connection. Um, Cause you know, for me, rituals of connection isn't just about voicing what you need, but it's about practicing communication. So when it does come to any boundary that I'm, and I don't even think, like, I can't even think really like we have boundaries as such. I'm doing like inverted sort of commas. We don't have anything like really like you can't do this, you can't do this. But as soon as something does come up, we're able to verbalize it. We we know the communication skills between you and me to be like, okay, cool. Like I know this is really important for him right now. I'm just going to be present and going to let him voice it or vice versa. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it really comes down to like that, that space that we've created and the skill of communication that makes it so successful. And it kind of means that we don't need to have all these boundaries as well. Yeah, it's yeah. It was a question, obviously, that we got sent um, on social media, and it just hasn't it hasn't really been a thing um, for, for either of us at this stage. And I can definitely see how it could show up in relationships. And I guess what I want to say as well to all of this is like, despite the fact that it's been really smooth sailing for the fifteen or sixteen months, is nothing's off limits like when we're not against you know fighting or or arguing or whatever it just hasn't been a thing for us so I think you know for some people whether they're people pleaser whether they you know struggle to use their voice is it might be on the surface calm but that's because they haven't you know wanted to rock the boat or they haven't voiced their opinion We, we like we're okay if that happens it just hasn't been a thing like if if the boat is rocked at some stage and someone really you know is having struggles with boundaries or whatever like we're not against it so just to kind of clarify that bit you know we 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 haven't had a fight in you know the 15 months that we've been together but we're also not against it you know in terms of neither of us you know and I, I this was a really big piece for me especially in the first three months knowing that you know Shani previously had been a bit of a people pleaser as you know I, I really overemphasized the importance of being able to use her voice and find confidence in it and kind of speak her truth, whatever that looked like. So just to be mindful of like, yeah, cool. You know, is it really smooth sailing from a clean energy or is it smooth sailing? Cause one of you suppressed or one of you is not voicing, you know, your truth, whatever it might be. So just kind yeah. of wanted to reiterate that from a, a communication point of view as well. Can we, can we touch on the funny one? Like, and this was a big part about like actually speaking what's on your mind. Like you would, you would always say like, no matter like what it is, it's like, speak it. And sometimes it, sometimes it's like, 
you know, it is shitty. And I remember this game that we played and it was like, you said, okay, you get to pick two, cl- two items of clothing that I can <laughs> that I'll throw out that yeah. you don't like, or that turns you off or anything. Mm. So I'm pretty sure you had those like, like gross out of that sneakers that I just like hated. They just look like dad shoes. Yep, apparently. <laughs> so anyway so I was like I don't like them I'm like they're going and I can't remember there was like another um uh, do you remember it the other it was like clothes. a jumper of some sort a jumper yeah yeah um but even something fun like that and like gamifying it just brings mm. back especially if your partner's not confident in speaking that their, their their full truth or saying something that might offend them um bringing that sort of game of gamification mm. to it actually like it just it just changes the energy and makes it a bit more fun than serious mm. yeah. um but yeah, that was a, that was a funny one, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and a uh, question we got: What makes this relationship different from others? You can you start on that one. I was meant to ask you that question. That's all right. You stole it. <laughs> <laughs> um, might be our first dispute here. Um, so what makes the relationship different from others? Well, I think we've always kind of wanted to do relationships differently, mm. and. Um, and I think that's always been a lens of everything that we do and not different for the sake of different. It's different for the sake of actually like doing things that are going to improve relationships. Like mm. majority of relationships and um, and marriages don't actually work out. It's like awesome. Mm. There must be not awesome, but like, cool. There must be something to fix here to improve it. Um, so like a, like a big thing that we do um, are you, are you okay if I share the bed thing? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I like that, the bed thing. Um, but, yeah, we have two nights a week where we sleep in separate rooms. So it's like Monday and Tuesday, um, Blake sleeps in his office, the spare room, and then I sleep in our room. And, like, just having that space to, like, and it's not even like you need the space. It's just space to be by yourself and to read and to, you know, catch up on whatever you want to catch up on. Um, and even for me as a projector, like I need a lot of like alone time, like full on alone time and living in a house with three boys and me uh, doesn't actually give me a lot of alone time. So like little things like that, that actually um, maybe a little bit like, you know, taboo in uh, for other people, but for us, it, it works so, so well. And like we get to, you know, Wednesday and I'm like so excited to have, you know, a sleep, like sleepover together and like be together and and I think it just comes back to this point, like, don't wait till something's broke to fix it. Like, why not implement strategies from the get-go um, to actually, like, help, you know, maintain a, a amazing relationship and create strategies of sustainability in a relationship rather than, you know, patching up things as they come up. Mm. What, what I things think, up to that? Um, well, a number of things. I think, you know, one of the, um, like, real significant differences in this compared to, potentially what I felt in other relationships is a real, like a real sense of partnership mm-hmm. and that we're on the same team and that we're each other's biggest kind of supporter. And, you know, like life can be challenging enough without feeling like you and your partner aren't a team. Mm-hmm. So there's a real empowering feeling that comes with knowing that you're on the same team, you're rooting for each other, and that you've really got that strong partnership. Yeah. And I think the other thing that really stands out is there's, I've always felt like there's a non judgmental space where I could just be myself. And again, you know, I can say that with ease and it kind of rolls off the tongue, but it also isn't that common. And I can speak firsthand to that, that I haven't felt in previous relationships that I could be myself. So when you put those two things together, one, that you can be yourself no matter what and two that you feel like you're in this ultimate kind of partnership where you got each other it creates a really healthy environment as well so those are a couple of things from my end what about you babe um yeah I think that part is so important just like it always feels like whatever I do in the world I've got my like safe space coming back Mm. to you and like knowing that yeah it is there's no judgment and I can say whatever's on my mind or my heart and like knowing that you'll hold space for it and even when it hurts like I've come back to you and been like you know, like, like saying something that actually is not so much hurtful, but it's Mm. like, it's hard to hold space, but you just do it anyway. And um, yeah, that's like amazing. Um, Hold on. So what else makes this relationship different from others? Mm, I think like um, the part where you said before is like, just 
like allowing space for like each other's values. Like I know that your mornings are like your mornings and like, Mm. you know, if, if, you know, you don't contact me for like three hours, like that's, it's nothing personal and it's just Mm. you just living out your values and and what truly means the most to you. Mm. Um, And like, imagine if every relationship we could literally give space for people to like follow their passions, live their values. Like if they need space, it's not personal. I think, I think relationships would look very, very different. Mm. One thing that has been like big for our relationship is just creating safety. Mm. And it's, it's a term that's often used towards women like what can the masculine do to create safety for the feminine but it's very rare that it's spoken of in reverse Mm. um but you know having obviously worked closely with a lot of men um and had these chats a lot like blokes also want to feel safe and you know that non-judgmental partnership that we've got has really created a sense of safety um where yeah exactly as you said I can kind of speak my mind I can kind of uh, come you know forward with anything and anyone who knows me quite well knows that I've got some kind of unique thoughts feelings behaviors that um aren't necessarily kind of meat and three veg white picket fence so to be able to be accepted in those and also you being open to kind of explore what those look like on a deeper level um has created safety as well yeah and I think like we it probably helps because both of us have been like the black sheep of the family so mm. it's like two black sheep with just starting our own little herd over here um but that 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 helps like finding someone in alignment you know with you is mm. is seriously like such an important part like I think mm. us not sharing the same beliefs and everything would I, it wouldn't make it too difficult, but it definitely um, wouldn't be as smooth as sailing. Mm. Um, and I kind of want to talk to um, a part about like holding space for your partner. And this is something that I didn't do very well at the start, but, you know, that's the benefits of dating a life coach. You kind of get these little <laughs> tips every now and then. Um, but like women, when you're holding space for your man, is like it's not about fixing. It's not about providing solutions or advice. It's literally just about like listening. And this was the hardest thing for me because I'm like a solutions uh, you know ninja um but just letting them kind of process it on their own that's that's so much more powerful than being like babe I can see this so clearly I'm like why don't you do this why don't you do that and sometimes I do but if I I'm like do you want to see it a different way like actually ask if they're willing to you know yeah maybe have a solution or maybe um have some advice or anything because if they don't ask for it they probably don't want it they just want to mm. vent and the other thing that you um have continuously got better at as well is being able to re so non-judgmental you do well but really hold space from a energetic and emotional point of view Mm. so what that looked like in the early stages is you probably got a little bit rattled at times with anger or or certain emotions that I would be kind of expressing Mm. whereas as this has evolved and probably as you've got even more comfortable with your own full emotional vocabularies, like you've been able to hold um, me in that as opposed to shut that down, suppress or not know kind of what to say or do. So that's a really big one as well. And I think that's probably something more that blokes struggle with is they can't hold the feminine. So if we're talking heterosexual, but you know, whatever Mm. dynamic role you, you, you work with, is it's a super common struggle for the masculine to be able to hold the feminine in their fullness when it comes to their emotions, whatever's going on for them. You know, they can kind of sit there numb, not present and a bit blank, but what does it look like to kind of really hold them in that as well? So that's a really important piece as well. Do you have any like practical takeaways for guys who do want to hold their women through like, you know, the whole range of motions? Like it sounds so easy, but like, is there anything, a practical takeaway mm. that you can give for men? The, f- the first thing that you need to be able to do is you need to create a better relationship with your own emotions, your own feelings. So you'll generally only be able to take someone to the depths that you've been yourself. So if you're not okay with your anger, you're probably going to struggle to hold someone else in their anger. If you're not okay with your sadness, your vulnerability, then you're probably going to struggle with someone else. So, you know, it, it, it can look... Um, really small to start and it might just be acknowledging that you're angry as opposed to shaming yourself or beating yourself up and if you look at 
you know, blokes in particular from a, a history point of view is, yeah, for most of us, we were told that anger is not okay as a kid, you know, and all these certain feelings, you know, don't be a pussy. Like, mm -hmm. so you've got a whole bunch of blokes walking around that are ticking time bombs because yeah. they've suppressed <laughs> their emotions for so long mm. that it's going to be the fucking spilt milk that like pushes them over the edge it's got nothing to do with the spilt milk it's the like 37 years of history that you haven't processed your emotions in real time that you then project out onto the spilt milk so mm. it's really about kind of starting small and starting to um, vocalize or integrate that emotional state that you find yourself in as opposed to suppressing it and trying to hide from it. And I think something you do really well is like most of the time guys won't have the right words to stay, to say, but knowing that's mm. okay. And sometimes like physical presence and just like witnessing the emotions is enough. Like you don't mm. uh, like, again, we're probably not looking for advice. Um, we're just looking for someone to, you know, be present with us to witness us to like let us sort of get to our own answers as well so that's something you do really well and at the start I'm like why isn't he saying anything and I'm like oh no he's just holding space you know mm. yeah it's I think it's a I think it's a good um default to put yourself into of like don't be Mr fix it and if you can default to like just holding space yeah. and then you know, probably ask if we're talking heterosexual again, probably ask the feminine or even communicate with the feminine that this is my default. I'm just going to hold mm -hmm. space for you. If you do want my opinion, my yeah. advice, then it's up to you to kind of ask for it. Otherwise, I'm just going to assume that you just want me to hold space. Yeah. So I think that's a much better default setting as a male, albeit against, you know, probably what is natural for you. Um, and then just to communicate if, you know, if the feminine wants something else, then then to kind of ask for it. So yeah, I'd start and, with that. And even that point, like that point that you make is like um asking them what they need right now or like how mm. like how can I support you? Is there anything you need? Mm. Um that's really helpful as well. And sometimes you might know what not know what you need or want, but even just having that there and that I know that I could always come back to you and be like, oh, I really need this or you mm. know, I need to talk it out or you know, I need space or whatever it is. Mm. Um, yeah, that's powerful. That yeah, that would be the, the final piece to that of um not assuming you think you know what they want and mm -hmm. just and don't don't underestimate the importance of such a, such a simple question of like how can I support you? Because you know, when you're going through your stuff, sometimes you just want to sit there and cry on me, sometimes you want to, you know, have a day to yourself, sometimes you're angry and want to go for a walk, like whatever comes up is fine yeah but if, if I was to assume that I know what you need then I would be you know taking away from really being present and, and allowing you to process in your own way so never assume you know what they need yeah yeah and across the board all relationships and friendships mm. um yeah that's awesome well, that's kind of podcast one isn't it that's podcast one done and dusted so uh we'll leave it there and mm. we'll move into part two. Amazing. See you guys on next week. Thanks for tuning in this week. As always, if you enjoyed listening, please leave a review, give us a shout out across socials or share with a friend so that we can continue to share these incredible conversations with more and more people.